I was asked by Bill, uh, we're seminary buddies, we're pastor buddies, we've known each other for a long time, we go, go to lunch here, we just saw each other recently, good buddy uh, Bill is, and he asked me to preach, and one of my Achilles heels is when uh, somebody says, yeah, preach, I don't care on what, show up, whatever the Lord leads, that paralyzes me. It, it kills me, and I've learned I, I fret too much over what the Lord wants the church to hear, and I, I, I just I can't get it, and then I end up rambling forever. All that to say, when Bill asked me, I said, one condition is that you give me a passage, and you confine it, restrict it, and tell me what it is, and then I'll show up. And he goes, done. You're introducing the book of Judges with the story of Ahud, <laughs> which is not quite what I was looking for. Um, I have the privilege of telling you a story full of potty humor about an assassination and somehow trying to make that worshipful. And it's the best story in Judges. It's downhill from there. So uh, buckle up, y'all. The, uh, the series, and I guess I'll issue it, I'll be the one to say, should come with a trigger warning. And, and I, I, I mean that seriously. It, it is full of violence, full of treachery, assault, uh, degradation of women and of outsiders, it's intense. And by the end of it, if your stomach's not churning, you might be a serial killer. It's, it's, it's a really, really rough read, and it just goes downhill and ends in ways that just sicken your stomach as a follower of Jesus. And it should. That's by God's design. And so I'd like to spend just a few moments introducing you to the book of Judges, and then we'll have uh, this story in Judges chapter 3 is a bit of a case study of this sort of thing, and then how, as followers of Jesus on this side of the cross, uh, we should avail ourselves of these lessons and what sorts of things God would be doing through stories like this. And you'll continue, I hope, to apply these lessons and these skills in the rest of the series. So uh, I, sh I should also say, I'm the last guy who should be doing something like this because I'm I need a trigger warning. Everyone I've ever worked for and with tells me I, I have a clinical lack of discretion. And uh, I say things, most people have like a hard door between the brain and the mouth hole. Mine's like a fence, chain link fence. It just, stuff comes out. And then I go, oh, I guess we're running with it now because I said it. So I'm, I've been praying this week that I could be proper and discreet and appropriate as we dig into some really tough things. But it's hard, y'all, because there's potty humor in this, literal potty humor. So I'm going to try and be mature as we uh, work our way into this book. Let me say something about Judges here. So Judges, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. So this is a, an early part of our Old Testament. And we pick up with the story, Israel has come in to the promised land that was promised in the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible that Moses preached about in Deuteronomy. And the first generation was kind of faithful to deal with the foreign influences and the peoples that were in the land. And then that generation dies off, and now we have the main story of Judges. And so when you read Judges, you're meant to apply the lessons of the sermons of Deuteronomy, the theology of Deuteronomy. Love, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And the Hebrew is ambiguous there. It's uh, one God and the only one, uh, the supreme and the only one. Therefore, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And teach your children to do the same. And then Jesus adds in the New Testament to this of the greatest commands, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So this is our, our grid, and it's the grid by which we judge things and judges as we read. And it's rough. If you flip to the end of Judges, chapter 21, and you can see, you don't have to, I'll, I'll uh, read it for you. Judges ends in abject horror with these lines. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And you're like, yeah, no, we get it. Thanks a lot, Captain Obvious. We get it by the end of this. It uh, leads many people to think that Judges is here to prepare us for King David. The Judite clan looks really good in Judges. The Benjaminite clan starts to look really bad and then ends awfully. And Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin and David is from Judah. That's not the whole story, however, because even Samuel makes clear in 1 Samuel chapter 8 that to pine after and then receive a human king is to reject what? I'm a teacher, so I need some feedback here. The kingship of Yahweh. 
right? Even a human king is to, in some ways, reject the kingship of Yahweh. Yahweh should have been king. And so when this book ends with, and there was no king in the land and everyone did what was right in his own eyes, it's because they have abandoned Yahweh as their true king. And David will not fix this problem, as readers of the Old Testament know. That ends in centuries of civil war and division. Jesus, the true king, is the one to whom we as readers of this book must maintain our allegiance, right? And so we as followers of King Jesus, this should drive us to be more allegiant and to not abandon King Jesus because that's the real lesson learned here from all of the stories of Judges. It's a, I, I did mention it's a downward spiral. It's an actual literary downward spiral. There are cycles that these stories in the body go through. And there are upwards of, you know, well, lots of elements, but we can kind of break them down into five elements. And each story in Judges that you'll read in this sermon series either adheres to or an expectation of this cycle subverts things. Things are missing, and that's part of the lesson of the particular story. Israel does what is evil in the eyes of the Lord, abandoning the Lord. The Lord is grieved and angered, not human anger. He's repulsed by that and sends a foreign nation to rule over them as punishment. He turns them over to the effects of their sin. They cry out, help us, Lord. He sends a deliverer, and then there's rest in the land. Okay, we'll see all five of these elements in our story today. And like I said, as you go on, by the time you get to Samson, the Samson cycle, you're like, what is happening? They're not even crying out. And the, you know, it's, it's bananas by the end. But these are the five elements of these stories that cycle, and they get longer and longer and longer and worse and worse and worse until the end when this is what it looks like to abandon Yahweh as king. It's almost like, I don't know if I'm allowed to say things like this, but again, I lack discretion. You know the proverbial kid who smokes a cigarette, uh, experiments with it, and then the parents are like, you're just smoking the whole pack now to get sick, and you'll never do it again. That's what the end of Judges feels like, is like, smoke the whole pack. Look at this. Don't look away. Get bothered by it. Be disgusted by it. Do not look away, because this is what life apart from Yahweh as king looks like and feels like, and these are the consequences. Anyway, uh, maybe now we should pray. Ask the Lord to be pleased, and whatever comes out of my mouth as we read, and then we'll uh, jump in. You know, it's not, all, it's not all dark. There are bright spots. Let me say that as well. There are moments of hope. There are demonstrations of what faithfulness looks like. The bad guy in our story is from Moab, a kingdom in the Transjordan across the Dead Sea from uh, the, the nation of Israel. The book after this uh, is Ruth. Where's Ruth from? She's from Moab. So there are bright spots in the days of the judges where people, even former enemies, can be faithful and can respond rightly. And we have stories of those that are just in sharp relief from the typical so, uh, so buckle up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please be with us as we engage with these tricky passages of Scripture. Be pleased. May your name be made great. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you for your word. We pray for the courage to engage with it rightly and the humility to do what we find out you want from us. We, your humble servants, in the name of Jesus, the King in heaven. Amen. Okay, so let's pick up in uh, Ez pfft, Ezra. There's a, that's not correct. Judges 3, uh, verse 12, and we'll begin. This is actually the second judge. Othniel has come before, and we're meant to absorb Othniel, working out just the way it should. All the things are firing. Othniel is held up in high esteem, and here we have Ehud. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. That is number one. And the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. There's the second thing in the cycle. Everything matters. Little details matter in, in Hebrew narrative. Well, in all stories, but especially in Hebrew narrative. It's real efficient and economical. And when there's a, a detail given or a, an elaboration on something, it matters. And so... Just heads up, because there's lots of little nuggets in here that help us make a better sense of this story in a delightful way. It's a delightful story, as weird as that is of an assassination. Ehud 
uh, is, uh, well, sorry, Eglon is, is, a, is a name in Hebrew that, that means calf. We're told later, uh, calf-like calves that are sacrificed in the Israelite sacrificial system. Uh, and we're told later that he's, he's hefty. He's a hefty fellow. And so just buckle up because this is a story about a fatted calf being offered to the Lord. And we'll have other sacrificial imagery along the way. So this is uh, Eglon of Moab controlled Israel because of their evil. Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and the Amalekites as allies. These, were, um, these are not awesome people. The Amalekites uh, tormented God's people and their, their wanderings in the wilderness and their entrance into the land. Uh, they did not deal with them as Moses commanded in Deuteronomy. And here they are, ironically, now subjugating these people. Uh, the Amorites are it's another kingdom above Edom uh, and, and Moab, uh, and, and so they're just kind of neighbors and cousins, really, genealogically connected to Israel, um, uh, both connected to Lot in Genesis. Um, but they're helping subjugate now. <clears throat> they went out and defeated Israel, uh, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. It's a little border city between Moab and the uh, Dead Sea Valley and then uh, the, the kingdom of Israel. So it's a real strategic spot that, that uh, Eglon uh, took. And the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. Othniel delivered uh, subjugation for eight years. So this is 10 more years than the last cycle. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud. Uh, and Ehud can, can, uh, it means in the Hebrew, where is my majesty? It's a real fascinating question being posed in this story. Where is the glory of God? Where is the majesty of God? As these people serve a foreign God. As they wanted to and did, and God gave them over to this sin, and now they are subjugated and serving a foreign people. And Ehud will be chosen to deliver uh, an offering to the feet of Eglon, whereas rightly, the Lord should be honored in his tabernacle at this time. There's no temple yet, and an offering should be brought to the Lord. Where is my majesty is one of the, the questions that should just kind of echo through this story, and then we'll, we'll find uh, an answer to that too, provided I remember to come back to that, which is no guarantee with me. <clears throat> uh, they cried out, to the Lord for help, and the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. So left-handed, anybody left-handers here? There's like three of you. Okay, way to go. Go team. This is, uh, you're rare. It's rare in the ancient world as well. Um, the Hebrew for left-handed really means a bound of right hand, or, or like uh, it doesn't work right. Um, and so that he's left-handed is interesting. It's a detail that'll come in to play later in this story. He actually happens, ironically, to be a part of uh, the tribe of Benjamin, son of my right hand. So there's a lot of hand things going on in this story. Another motif through this story, by the end of it, uh, Israel, Moab is delivered to the hand of Israel, and we know that as little as the Lord is actually mentioned, all of these things are done by the hand of Yahweh. So hand is a, is a thing, and it's ironic that the tribe of Benjamin, the son of the right hand, uh, would, Ehud, this left-handed warrior, would come out of. And we see, that actually, they did this on purpose. There were militaristically strategic advantages to confusing what would have been otherwise expected of a shield and a right-hand sword, and we'll see it comes into play here later in this story as well. So the left-handed man from the tribe of right-handed people the Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. This is another word for offering, uh, the, the sacrificial imagery. He's delivering the tribute. Uh, fully subjugated these peoples. He's oppressing them. He's taking all of their resources. And as we'll see, growing fat and happy off of it. He's profiting from their uh, subjugated service to him. Uh, and this, this is bound to change here because of what Ehud will do. Uh, sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to the king Eglon of Moab. So Ehud made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long. In Hebrew, two-edged sword is literally two mouths. And so this, uh, again, with the eating and the, Im uh, the sacrifice imagery, the sword is going to eat something up here in a minute. And we're just kind of prepared for that by the little details here. 
uh, a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. Uh, again, here's this fatted calf, profiting. So it's a, it's a detail that's not as pejorative as you may think. It's uh, somebody who's quite comfortable and corpulent because of this life of luxury. And we know because of his subjugation of God's people here. And so it's a bad thing. And if you're an Israelite hearing this story later, you're going, <laughs> we're going to get him. You know, it's that, it's that kind of uh, the subjugated peoples, these stories mean something different than it does necessarily to us, we who are uh, often quite privileged and subjugated by not much, right? So this is, we got to bear that in mind with the details of this story. The things that we um, see that an original reader might have delighted in need not necessarily delight us in the same ways and probably won't. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. After delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gil Gilgal, he turned back. It's so fascinating. There's no real mention of like oh, the idols, which were awful and had no place in Israel. It's just accepted as a detail of this story. Like, yeah, Gilgal, on the way back, passes the idols and he turns back around. This is probably telling because what we know, the, the sin that pervades the people of Israel and has led them to this place and will continue to do so and more and more horrific uh, examples of this is idolatry. They have been infiltrated by foreign influences, and their devotion to Yahweh has been compromised. And, and at times, they have just turned away because of the, you know, the idols are just there. It's just a part of life, and so just deal with it. You know, let's get on with it. It's fascinating what the Bible does and then doesn't say here. It's just uh, it's a part of the story. So he turns back at this uh, idol site near Gilgal, which is probably considered a, a shrine and a place where oracles could be received, and he kind of plays on that when he comes back. This story is, uh, it just gets weirder and weirder. Uh, he, uh, he turns back from the stone idols near Gilgal. He came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. There's all kinds of ambiguity here. I have a uh, a word, a davar in Hebrew, which, which can mean a word or a message or a thing. It's really, it's a multi-purpose word. And there's some ambiguity because we as readers know, hmm, he's got a dagger for you. I got a thing for you. And Eglon mistakes it for, oh, you have an oracle. You have a, a, a message for me. And so it's real, again, just playing on the ambiguities here with, with a great delight because we see what's coming to the fatted calf. Uh, where Lord, the Lord will be regain his majesty through, uh, through Ehud. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet, and he sent them all out of the room. The Hebrew is a, it's an onomatopoeia. It's just shh. Uh, even, even a story that's uh, this old, is this, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, generations and different uh, countries have been hushing with shh, be quiet. I lost my place. Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room. This is his throne room. as It can be closed off, as we'll see, from the, the main reception area. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. As the king, in, in, uh, the king rises from his seat in anticipation, of course, it also exposes some vulnerabilities. And so uh, he thinks, well, he's got an oracle for me. We have record in the ancient Near Eastern world of oracles being delivered to kings and their throne room where they're expected to receive these sorts of messages. The gods will tell us what to do, and yes, the gods can, your god can tell us what to do, because I now run the place in the kind of the, the, the way of thinking through a foreign king. So yeah, he, he's, he arises, he sends people out to receive this message, this thing uh, from God. As King Eglon rose from his seat, and there's a real uh, economy here. Uh, these three verbs, he did this, and then he did this, and he did this, and then it's over. It's a real, the thing happens here in this climactic piece of this story. Ehad reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. The dagger went in so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. And fat is another piece of sacrificial terminology in the Hebrew. The, the, the entrails and the fat are to be treated differently with certain offerings as prescribed in Leviticus. So this is an offering in a twisted, bizarre kind of way that we're reminded of with this terminology. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger, and then it came out the back. The Hebrew is a little ambiguous here, and it 
We have a hunch in light of later details of the story that his bowels evacuated upon death. And we also have record in uh, war annals in the ancient Near Eastern world of people being able to say, yeah, that guy's dead because his bowels were empty. We don't need to stab him again. You know, that sort of thing on record in these ancient military annals. So we have a hunch that's what's going on here in light of some of the other hilarious details of the story to follow. So again, I know this is just a weird spot that Bill put me in to have to tell you a story about an assassination and evacuated bowels and somehow avoid jokes that are not appropriate for this place on the stage. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger and the king's bowels emptied. Then Ehud closed the door, closed and locked the doors of the room and escaped, I'm reading from the New Living Translation too, escaped down the latrine. So this is like a Shawshank Redemption escape here. Uh, if you will. This is one possibility. Again, the Hebrew is a little ambiguous, but he got out undetected and was able to lock this door, which comes into play here. Uh, so he he's, uh, uses ingenuity, he's creative, he takes risks to be able to deliver his people. And somehow, in some way, the Lord is working in and through this bizarre story to deliver his people. He closed and locked the doors and escaped down the latrine. After Ahud was gone, the king's servants returned, and, and then the Hebrew, there's a way of telling stories that's like a perspective shift in a movie. Like, now we're seeing it from this character's eyes. Uh, and and the, the Hebrew word is, and behold. And so there's this series of, and look, and behold, they see this, and look, and behold, this. And so now we're drawn in the story to see it from the attendant's eyes because of the way this, this story is told. After Ahud was gone, the king's servants returned, and behold, they found the doors to the upstairs room locked. And behold, they thought he might be using the latrine in the room, because, you know, there was an odor. Don't go there. Don't say it. They thought he might be using the latrine. And so they waited, but when the king didn't come out after a long delay, and again, the Israelite audience is going, those stupid people, we totally took them. You know, it's, it's a, there's, there's a morbid delight uh, that, that the original audience would take in this because everybody looks bad from these peoples that have been abusively and coercively ruling over them for 18 years. <clears throat> and behold, they found their master dead on the floor. And the rest of this is just kind of mop up in the way the story is told. While the servants were waiting, a hut escaped, passing the stone idols, there are the idols again, on his way back out from Gilgal. He arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, he sounded a call to arms. He led a band of Israelites down from the hills. Follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy, has given Moab into your hands. Uh, and here is a mention of the Lord, and Eglon acknowledges this is the Lord's doing. He has given uh, victory into your hands, Moab, your enemy. So they followed him, and the Israelites took control of the shallow crossing of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. It's a little ancient military strategy here in light of the geography uh, of the place. They attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. There's something uh, probably here going on with numbers and militaristic accounts. Um, Eleph, the Hebrew word for thousand, 10,000, also means clan. So it could just be 10 little units. Uh, in a military just as, as plausibly. And in light of what we know about the size of these peoples, and it's probably 10 units of there, but the decimated is the idea here. Uh, their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped, and so Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years, which is twice as long as Othniel's peace was, 40 years. So kind of two generations, if you will. And Amen. What in the wide world of sports are we supposed to do with this, huh? So um, I'll take a stab and see what we could do. There are always, when you read a story as the people of God, you are, you are asking, well, what's happening in this particular story? Who is God? What is a right or wrong response from either God's people or his enemies? What do I, as part of the people of God, need to make of it now, right? This is part of the exercise with each of these particular stories. I am going to, well, so this is a story about people crying out for deliverance, and God has mercy and delivers them in a bizarre fashion with a hood, who's the Lord's servant. I think I'd like to go kind of move beyond just this story. You know, there are 
probably examples in your life that you could apply of what it looks like to uh, respond to God when you are uh, wandering and feeling the effects of your sin and crying out to God and he hears and uh, maybe if you want to take it from the perspective of a hood, uh, God can use your creative and faith-filled efforts to do good things, surprising things sometimes on behalf of God and his people. Now, let's take a step back, and let's look at this from the book of Judges, since I'm introducing the book of Judges to you. Thanks, Bill, wherever you are. And I would like to uh, think through bigger picture. So this happens, 80 years of peace. Some things are missing from this story, however. What's missing? The people are fine. Then they go back to doing the same things again in the next story, and then it all happens over again. And then they're fine, and then it happens all over again, because it's like a dog returning to its vomit, as the Proverbs would say, right? It just keeps happening. What's missing is a genuine return to the Lord in light of all of this, which we have on record in the Old Testament. Josiah, when he discovers the Torah of God, a uh, king described in 2 Kings, leads a religious return, uh, the hearts of God, uh, the hearts of people to, to the Lord, right? This is, it's, it's a glaring omission in light, of, in light of this. And it has to do with the lessons that we talked about at the beginning. This is what it looks like when people abandon the Lord as king. And these are some of the things that can cause you as a people to abandon the Lord as king. So this is real dumb text kind of lessons here for us to learn. So just a few guidelines, grid really, for the rest of your, uh, your series. I've written all of these out. I've got uh, detailed sermon notes with some applicational thoughts and a little introduction to judges that I've uploaded as PDFs to a Google Drive folder. I'll send it to Cody, send the link, and you can just get that from him if you want more. There's a lot more because I'm a Bible professor and I really enjoy the preparation process. So, but you, it's there if you have it. So let's just say a few things here. Um, uh, the things that happen in Judges, the violence, the treachery, because you read it, it doesn't mean it's being condoned, okay? So this is not a celebration of these things. It's quite the opposite. So don't get, don't approach these stories and go, well, my Bible says it, and so I can do it, you know? Like, don't go assassinate someone because of this story. That's not the right thing to do, okay? So, just, just understand that, that when it shows up in the Bible, and awful things are going to show up in these pages, it's not an endorsement. So you don't need to be troubled by it, and you can respond to folks who are like, oh, the Bible, we can't read this anymore. It's, again, you're, you're being forced to look at these awful things, not look away, so that you don't abandon the Lord as king, okay? So um, I, I think that, that bears repeating God also uses people who are deeply flawed. That's good news for all of us deeply flawed people, but it's also not an endorsement of the people and the things that they do. Gideon's fleece, for example, that's a bad thing. That is divination in the ancient world, and God still mercifully condescends and meets him there, but it is not an endorsement. You do not try and manipulate God for your answers and for your guidance. Okay, so just again... These are deeply flawed people who happen to be mercifully used by God to accomplish his purposes. But it's not an endorsement. Don't go doing what Samson does, right? These are, this is a, this is a tricky thing here. Um, there are repeated opportunities to return to the Lord and to respond rightly to the Lord. And we must ask as followers of Jesus, as people of God in the New Testament era, has God perhaps given you a chance to return mercifully. Take advantage of it. Return wholeheartedly the right way, not like these chuckleheads, right? So this is another one of these kinds of lessons that you're just going to be confronted with over and over and over. should also say God delivers his people from his enemies, from their enemies. And we, as followers of Jesus, filtering through the grid of the ethic that Jesus imparts, have a whole different ball game that we're playing. The one who tells us that not just uh, murder is bad on the Sermon on the Mount, but anger itself, who not just says, hey, um, forgive your enemies, but pray for them too. This is the, it's a, the face of God revealed more fully and, and, and most fully and completely in the person of Jesus. 
instructs us, gives us a grid to read these stories as well. And so read the Sermon on the Mount. It's like mouthwash. Read the Sermon on the Mount five times a week before you come to church and read Judges because that's your cleansing, your palate cleanser, your guide for this is the, is the person and work of Jesus. So, <clears throat> uh, and then idolatry. I'll, I, I don't know you all. Uh, I work with a company that has people from all over, and so I've gotten out of the habit of saying y'all, but I'm in Texas, I'm from Texas. So y'all, I don't know y'all. The pastoral staff, the elders, uh, you know each other, your small group leaders, I'll let you deal with this. I'll just launch it out in there and see what happens. Idolatry. There is no more pernicious and pervasive ill that plagues the people of God in our country than idolatry in many forms. So don't think because you don't worship little statues anymore that you're not being poisoned by idols and their idolatrous effects. It's for you to work out in your context. I don't know you, and I don't want to come across as callous and unloving. (laughs) In a loving way, I would like to suggest that you must deal with idolatry and its pernicious and pervasive effects as you engage with this sermon series and learn the lessons that Israel should have. The people of Old Testament, the people of old, God's people of old should have, should have learned as well. So we're done. I'm going to wrap it up right now. And uh, we'll say in light of all of that, uh, this. The big idea from this and from this series, the thing that this should push us towards as followers of Jesus, Jesus the King, Messiah, King on the throne who rules, has inaugurated the new creation, and we are little bits of this, of God's future and the present, new creation. Behold, if anyone is in Christ, Paul says, new creation. We represent God's future and live under the rule of God, Uh, and it's a privilege, it's a blessing, it's a gift. It comes at great cost, however, Uh, This is our task, and so for us to read a story from the Old Testament about these poor idiots who abandoned the sovereign rulership of Yahweh and exchanged it for any other thing but Yahweh, they're almost eager to abandon Yahweh for all these other things. We read this through the grid of Jesus is now on the throne, and so our elite, so here, serve, this this is kind of the book summed up as New Testament believers. Serve King Jesus with wholehearted and with exclusive allegiance. Allegiance is probably a better representation of the, of the, the idea of faith in the New Testament. Uh, serve King Jesus with wholehearted and exclusive allegiance. And watch him do wonderful things in and through you all here. If you set apart Christ as Lord, it's going to confuse people. It's not hard to confuse people these days because... Uh, Being forgiving and generous and gracious and welcoming is rather shocking, even for God's people. So uh, serve Jesus with wholehearted and exclusive allegiance and watch him do wonderful, incredible things in your midst. Uh, I will say, it seems like he is doing wonderful and incredible things in your midst. Um, uh, I see more and more signs of life here. We were in a whole other thing last time I was here. And uh, more faces, more, more disciple makers to mobilize and deploy here in this area of the Metroplex. I'm really encouraged. I hope that you will somehow maintain encouragement and joy as you work your way through this book. Good luck to whoever's taking it from here. Uh, but it's, that's, the, that's the overriding grid again that I've provided. And you can dig into this a little more if you want. Uh, with notes, but that's enough for you to talk about, that's enough for you to discuss and pour over you together, the people of God with God's Spirit, engage with the Word of God to see God and to be transformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus and watch Him do wonderful things in and through you. Can I pray uh, for us, please?